following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Christic and demonic initiation. Um, <clears throat> we're going to talk today about this word initiation, which is something we often speak about in this tradition and other traditions. And in order to better understand that our purpose or our, our place here in the world is something that we have to define within ourselves. Um, often today in, in our kind of modern culture, even if you consider yourself spiritual or people who consider themselves spiritual, they take it upon you know this, this idea that there's a type of evolution happening, um, a type of spiritual or cosmic evolution that will take us to perfection, kind of to enlightenment, to a golden age. And there's a lot of beautiful words to talk about the future golden age. <clears throat> But uh, we need to clarify that in order to achieve the development of our consciousness and our soul, in order to achieve religion, to connect ourselves with our innermost, with our spirit, we need to partake upon the path of initiation. So here in our title, we have Christic and Demonic Initiation. And again, this word demonic, of course, it's always kind of maybe a scandalous word. But in today's world, in our, in our modern culture, the word demonic is a special type of um, reaction against people who consider themselves to be spiritual, perhaps, in some, sometimes. Because today, this, there's this idea that to, talk, to mention about something demonic is almost like a superstitious antiquated type of concept or idea. And, you know, in today's world, we need to, to facilitate or, or develop two very important qualities. And the first quality we can say is tolerance, and the second quality would be discernment or discrimination of a conscious type. To discriminate within ourselves what's developing our consciousness or what's, what are we developing in our soul or through our mind, or psychologically developing in a, in a positive way or a negative way. And a modern type of spirituality kind of wants to do, do away with discernment and kind of accept this idea that we're all basically mechanically evolving towards a spiritual state. And therefore, to talk about like some type of development or to talk to, to use the word demonic seems silly or antiquated. <clears throat> but we know that there's two ways to develop the consciousness. And we also know that we cannot develop the full development of the consciousness without performing conscious efforts and sacrifices. So this idea of evolution is uh, very prominent. And if we look at, you know, different, even in our Gnostic teachings, 
We have um, teachings about previous cosmic days and um, different periods and uh, humanities that appear in each round or cosmic day. And we are talking about that currently we are in the terrestrial period. We're in the fifth root race, and there'll be future root races, and there'll be future rounds. And there's some type of evolution there in a certain sense. But in order to be fit for those future humanities, there has to be a conscious development there. And we can also see in prior lectures we talk about, if I can find the... In, prior, in other lectures, we talk about evolution and devolution. And we can say that our current psychology is the product... Our current psychology is the product of evolution. We, as a soul or an essence, are entered into the mineral kingdom. We're given a physical body related to the mineral kingdom. And through an evil evolving process through experience through guidance of higher intelligent forces we evolve into having a plant body and the plant body is more sophisticated than the mineral type of body and through a lot of experiences we evolve into an animal kingdom where we have bodies that have three brains or two brains I should say excuse me so that are more emotional and have more of a, a complicated type of body that handles more complicated energy. And through evolution, we develop even the intellect, which is where we find ourselves today in current humanity, where we have this psychology that has evolved, has, has processed itself. We have our, our intellect and our emotions. So it is kind of expected to think that, you know, from a certain perspective, that we'll continue to evolve. But this is a mistaken concept. And even in many spiritual or new age type of schools, which are, you know, in, as a whole, very good and positive things, like in uh, theosophical writings, in writings of Rudolf Steiner and Max Heindel, other occultists who were truly awakened at some level or teaching something positive, they were very vague and mistaken about what the necessities are to um, achieve the full development of possibilities of the human being. They never really explicated or explained what the process of initiation is and what is required. In a certain respect, it wasn't their duty, it wasn't their role to do that. But... If we only were to read those authors, we would get an idea that there's just this evolution, and if there's other things going on and people developing themselves negatively, then that's just part of the way things go. And then eventually they would be carried in towards the, you know, just evolving towards the light eventually. Um, I think, you know, there's this idea that if there was someone acting wrongly, well, they're just a straggler. They're just, they're just a straggler on the evolving current, but eventually they'll kind of evolve and, and progress and ascend. So we need to be clear that evolution has its pinnacle, and once, it, once the pinnacle is reached, then it's reached its maximum point. And then after that, it's going to start to devolve, and the comp all that complication of energy is going to start fading away now. So this is why it's important to talk about initiation, because initiation, just that word means to initiate. So initiating something new, a new type of current, a new development. And secondly, as we talked before, we need to develop the, the quality of discernment within ourselves to know when we are developing in a way that is awakening our consciousness, liberating our consciousness, or strengthening our ego, strengthening our desires, and putting us more into bondage. And, you know, in a, a simple sense, that is the two paths that we could call Christic or demonic. So when we say demonic, really we're just pointing towards 
the ego, towards ourself. Because that is really, you know, the work with the demon is the work with our own ego. And so we shouldn't be scandalized by that idea. We find ourselves today in what we could call an existential crisis. If we were to look at the um, current world today, we can find it, all of our major systems in the world are kind of faltering and crumbling. And there's a lot of problems everywhere. And the way to look at this, if we examine the first two world wars, we can see that after the first world war, there was a very terrible flu, sometimes called the Spanish flu or the flu of 1918, is one of the worst um, epidemics of disease. And this was the product of all the terrible conditions of World War I. And of course, also karma related to that. But the Second World War had this mental pest that is far worse than the pest of the First World War. We are referring to the abominable existentialist philosophy that has totally poisoned the new generations. The revolution of the dialectic proclaims itself against such philosophy. This is what uh, Samuel and Veor wrote in the revolution of the dialectic. So what is the existentialist philosophy? It is this philosophy that there really is no point to life other than what you might put into it yourself, some type of absurd, random, chaotic existence. So we have different ways of, of different types of personalities. If they find themselves more spiritual, they might think, well, everybody's kind of evolving and I shouldn't really make a discernment of what's going to, you know, be positive versus negative. And then you have other people who are just kind of absent of any type of spiritual longing, and they, they find that life just has an absurd nature. And this is where this existentialist type of philosophy comes from, that, that there's this, life is just this strange comedy of errors that has no purpose behind it. And from a certain sense, if you are not developing your consciousness, if you're not looking to achieve initiation, then what is the point of this culture or the, of this world? Where is the foundation of it? You won't find it anywhere else but whatever this random world is, and we can see it's just a chaos of different things. So, these are two, um, two types of mistaken points of view that we can clarify now. You know, this existential crisis brings us to this mythological character called Sisyphus. And the title of this slide, Sisyphean Culture. I picked this uh, slide because for some reason, all those existentialist philosophers were very, they made a lot of comments about Sisyphus. So they saw this story of this uh, poor man who was condemned to carrying a very heavy stone up a, a mountain. And every time he was about to place it on the, the top of the mountain, it would fall down because it was um, enchanted by Zeus such that it would fall down again. And then he had to do the whole work again, and he was condemned to repeat this process forever. And we know that this story has a very strong initiatic symbolism of the person who does lots of effort, but because of their mistakes related to the rock, which we know has relationship to sexual transmutation, to the foundation of the work, that the rock falls down and then he has to do the whole work again. Well, the existentialist philosopher said, well, I, I imagine that, that Sisyphus is actually smiling during this and he's laughing because life is just absurd and his, his ordeal is absurd, but he's enjoying it somehow. And this is kind of, kind of how the kind of existentialist viewpoint is, is, is subtly kind of put into our modern culture. I mean, the modern person doesn't really think of themselves in a philosophical term, but you know, if they don't have a spiritual inclination, they just kind of see life as a bunch of random absurdities. And, you know, just laugh at whatever's funny and kind of do whatever you wish. And, you know, that's what life is. But make it something, you know. What the real initiatic, um, the real initiatic symbolism behind this story is actually very profound. There's different stories about him, but the general content is that 
he, that Sisyphus thought he was very clever. He thought he was very smart, and he was trying to trick the gods. He, was, he thought he could uh, be more clever than them, including Zeus. So because of some of his, his schemes, he was sent to Tartarus, or the underworld. And he was supposed to be chained up by uh, death, or Thanatos. But he tricked Thanatos. He tricked death, so he chained death up, and so he, he's able to go. So now that death is chained up, no one could die. And eventually, you know, of course, more things happen. Eventually, he does get um, punished, and that's what his punishment is. So he, was, he had to lift up this heavy stone. But you see, Sisyphus really is the ego. The ego thinks he's more clever than God. The ego thinks it's, it can do its own thing, its own way. It, can, it, can, it doesn't have to abide by any laws. So he thinks he's more powerful than even, even Christ. And the ego doesn't let anyone die. The ego holds on to all of its desires. It, doesn't, it tries to chain down even death. So you can see psychologically the ego doesn't want to die. The ego tries to keep all of our egos still alive. All of our desires. It tries to defeat even death. But of course, this type of behavior just leads to misery, which is the, the Sisyphean tragedy. And this is our current culture. You know, our current culture thinks it's more clever than the divinity that created it. It rejects that divinity by the virtue of its own ignorance. So we are currently, really, this, this character, if you, are not, if you are not working on yourselves and you don't know the doctrine, you don't know how to achieve initiation, then you may be working very hard, even if you are a spiritual person, very hard to develop yourself. But if you don't know the fundamental foundation of initiation, then you will be condemned to be like Sisyphus. So this rock here, whenever you see the stone in, symbol, in um, religion, we know that the stone relates Kabbalistically to the sphere of Yasod. And we see this stone in many different doctrines. Um, we can talk about, for example, in Christianity the foundation stone, which is called the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. So nothing is more, more of a stumbling block and a rock of offense than, than when we talk about sex. Because this is, this is what the rock is. Because from, from Yesod, we have the foundation. That's what Yesod means. And we can see from this foundation, everything else, all the, diff, all the other columns are on that foundation. They rest upon that. Because it's there... In the sexual energy, we have our creative energy. And the creative energy is the conduit or the connection that we have as an individual to the creator. We have the ability, when we sexually unite, to behave or to be reminded of the creator, of the three primary forces. This is where creation comes from. So we have that as a reflection in ourselves. But of course, we have desire. We have the ego. So when we think of sex, we think of desire. We think of lust. We think of the thing that defiles us, really. Or if we're lacking discernment, if we're lacking discrimination, we would just accept that we're just here to sexually enjoy ourselves in all the different ways that we find ourselves to want to have, to be. We don't challenge that. We think, this is the way I was put here. I have these desires, or I have this energy, and this is the way to use it. Well, part of that is because we don't, the, the, the doctrine has not been taught how to transmute sexual energy. But the other half is really you know, becoming more conscious, having a spiritual longing, and then not rejecting... Um, I was having a spiritual longing, but not rejecting uh, uh, desire or lust. Those two things combining will lead you towards initiating yourself to go down, not to go up. Because what happens? You see, you can see here this area down here, the 
clip off, this is related to the inferior dimensions, which is always symbolized by hell or Tartarus or all the different inf inferior worlds, the inferno. And up here we have all the heavenly worlds, all the superior dimensions. Physical body and our vital body, Malkuth and Yasod, are really connected as one thing, but we separate them as two. And it's in our vital body, it's in our sexual energy, it's in our sexual behavior that really is the access upon which that energy gets or progresses downward further or is transmuted and goes up. So really it's, it's chastity or the lack of chastity that defines whether our consciousness is going to develop through the liberation of desire or through the crystallization of desire. This is, this is the crux because the creative sexual energy is what's going to develop our consciousness. It the, is the base root energy of, of what we are. It's the extract of everything that we are. If you think about it, we eat food, we breathe, we drink water or what, whatever fluids. We have our impressions. All this enters into the body. We have a vital body. We have the chakras, which are bringing in energy and transforming energy. All of this goes into our body, goes into our bloodstream. And from the bloodstream, all of our hormones are developed. You know, so, so you're taking all this information, all this, and it's, it's being like condensed and purified and put into an extract, which we can call our sexual creative energy. Now that sexual creative energy is our hormones, any sexual fluid, the semen, but it's also that energy that's held in the vital body. So it's not just something physical. Because you can think of our physical sexual energy as the body of that energy, but we have a soul of that energy and a spirit of that energy. So you, it's not just a physical thing. That's something we're going to talk about in a little bit. So we have all this external like in, information and nourishment coming in, plus we're having this, this, in, this energy from the Akasha coming down and descending and going into our chakras. So it's, it's a mixture of our experiences, our state of mind, our transformation of impressions, combined with our spiritual archetypes. And what are our spiritual archetypes? Those are located in what we would call the sixth dimension. But we have a connection to them. We fertilize them through our behavior of chastity or not. If, you, if we don't have chastity, but we have a spiritual longing, and we try to direct our sexual desire in a way that combines with our spiritual longing, we end up developing ourselves in a negative way. If we use our sexual energy in combination with our spiritual longing, but in a way that transmutes that energy, that energy goes up and liberates ourselves. Both types of practices develop the consciousness. But only one type of practice liberates the consciousness from desire. And this, this, again, is the crux. And it all has to do with chastity. And again, this word chastity, in a, in, a, in a modern sense, can be kind of scandalous. Because we have this culture that's rejecting Victorian values. Values of um, a type of sexual repression that was very ignorant. A type of not just Victorian values, but all the way back to, you know, thousands of years of type of hating, hating that sexual impulse and that purity was, was found through just rejecting sex. That's, that's the type of fanaticism that came about from not knowing the true doctrine. So originally, whether it's in Christianity or Buddhism or Hinduism, you always have the clergy the monks and the nuns that had to be celibate. They had to restrict themselves from, from um, sexual expression. They had to be chaste is really the right word. Because chastity is something of the mind and the heart as well. But that was only a preparation 
once you entered into that and proved yourself worthy, that would be a preparation to say, okay, this person is serious. They've learned how to work with their mind. They, learn, the word, they, they know how to transmute as, an, as a single person. After that, which would only take place in secrecy, because they didn't want this doctrine to be defiled or to be uh, destroyed, they would be entered into a secret part of that teaching, which would pair up the monks with the nuns. A monk would work with a nun in sexual cooperation. And we can see hints of that here and there. If you look, if you look in the right places in religion, but they're usually banished as heretics. And you see that maybe a little bit better in some forms of Buddhism, which survived and still have that doctrine, but it's very, very um, secluded and not really taught publicly and not really uh, given access to. But it's there. So we're here teaching now that this type of practice is the right of any individual who wishes to develop their consciousness. But we need to be very clear that just to um, use you know, uh, our sexual energy in relation with spirituality needs to be very, very, very clearly elucidated that which way develops our consciousness by liberating itself from the ego and which type of behavior develops our consciousness in the ego or develops our ego because both ways can give us experiences both ways can for example have an experience outside of our body or in the astral plane both ways can can empower the consciousness but only liberated from the consciousness will you be able to have true objective knowledge of course if you if you awaken your consciousness in desire then you are what Plato would say, a king in hell. You're developing those powers, but you're developing them in hell. It was better to be a beggar in heaven than a king in hell. So this is something that most people don't realize. That there are two ways. And that is why the title, that's why they chose the title of this lecture as it is. So, we find ourselves evolving. We evolve into different types of bodies. Our soul does. Our soul undergoes a metempsychosis, a metamorphosis of the psyche through, through more complicated and more complicated kingdoms. So, the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom. And finally, with the humanoid kingdom, we develop the intellect. And it's in the humanoid kingdom that we need to now direct our creative energy in a particular way according to individual willpower because we have the ability to individualize ourselves. In the animal kingdom, of course, animals behave as animals. Animals behave as a group mind. And they are under control of you know, superior forces guiding that evolution. But you know, animals work in packs. They work, they work as a group mind and they they, of course, use their sexual energy as they are kind of instinctually inclined to do so. But that, that is actually something good for their evolution at that point because it's through that act that they are still, they are still kind of evolving their intellect, you could say. It's not really the intellect yet. And that is also providing an energy. You know, any, any animal, of course, just uses, you know, the animal th level of, of sexuality is to just have sex instinctually, and fornicate, orgasm, ejaculate. And that is how animals reproduce themselves. So what's happening here is that energy is coming down, that creative energy from the higher planes, connecting, and of course, when that happens, it's producing something physical. But that energy is also binding the animals to this evolving and devolving current. It's providing an energy to the whole planet that helps um, crystallize the planet, that, that helps keep the planet stable. If the animals didn't do that, there would be no energy going into the planet to keep it stable, if that makes any sense. It would be, too, it would be mush. 
Because this planet, even this planet, when it was created, it took many cosmic days or development, first in the higher planes, and then it crystallizes heavier and heavier and heavier. And it needs to be here in the terrestrial world. In order to be here in the terrestrial world, it needs that energy at, the, at that level, that heavy energy. So part of, that, part of the role of the animal kingdom is to provide that energy. Of course, as intellectual animals in the humanoid kingdom, we have that impulse to continue to behave in the same way that we behaved in the animal kingdom, to just use sex in an in, in instinctual way. But of course, now we have the intellect, so we come up with ways to make that more complicated or to kind of extract more desire out of it or to justify that desire. So we really make it worse. So we are worse than any animal in that sense. And when we, you know, perform the sexual act in the, in the normal way, or we say is the animal way, at the animal level, we are binding ourselves tighter to this evolving and devolving wheel. And really, because we're at the top of this wheel when we're in the humanoid kingdom, we're providing that energy to connect ourselves tighter to this descending arch. So that's why when you continue to use a sexual energy in that way, it goes down and out. You're connecting yourself to that current of going down and out. So you develop your ego more, and you bind yourself with more karma, and you end up going down faster. So without uh, a conscious sacrifice, there's no way to step off this wheel because everything here is mechanical. And if we just act mechanically, then this is all this wheel is for. You know, this, this, this wheel is serving a purpose for this planet. And this planet has a purpose not only to develop the humanoid, to develop the human, but also to serve a purpose in the, in the cosmos as a whole. You know, in the same way. You know, this, so this planet has multiple purposes. If there was... You know, if, if it, this planet, for its own economy, is perfectly happy with, no, with nobody achieving initiation. Perfectly happy. No concern. Because this planet functions like an organ in a body called our solar system. And for that solar system to operate, it just needs, it needs to act in a certain way to transform certain energies, to transmit certain energies in the cosmic scale. It doesn't need to create human beings achieving initiation. It just needs to it just achieve this economy of energy. So that is, that is our inheritance. Our ego wants, is just a product of this. And to have an intellect and to realize that can really make it feel like life is absurd, that life is meaningless. And this is what happens sometimes, is someone kind of sees the world in a way it doesn't see any purpose behind it. It just feels like it's all purposeless. And in fact, without, without the spirit, without initiation, there is no other purpose. So in a certain sense, that, makes, that does make sense. <clears throat> but if we don't reject the spirit, then we say, how do we work with it? How do we, how do we achieve something more? And as I said, the foundation of initiation is, is chastity. So, what does that mean? Because we have these two words, chastity and celibacy. And normally they're used intertwined. But we should, uh, again, have some discernment and see what the difference is. Chastity means the proper use of sexual energy, sexual creative energy. Celibacy is just talking about the restraint to not sexually unite. Chastity means to use sexual energy in the right way, the proper way. So that means, for example, if someone takes a vow of chastity and they really know what that means, that person can enter into sexual union or have a marriage and not break that vow of chastity. Because to connect sexually and keep chastity is really the way to achieve initiation. However, this, of course, feels like a tremendous sacrifice. It feels like a, an unbearable pain 
to reject uh, the orgasm and say, well, what they, we think in our modern culture, that's the whole point of sex. But we have to say that there's different functions. Sexuality functions in a way that produces other bodies and that, and that ties us to the evolving and devolving wheel. But sexuality has a spiritual purpose as well. And everybody has to make that choice of what they want to develop. If they want to use that energy to develop themselves consciously, to develop their soul and connect to their spirit, then that is what is required. Otherwise, all that energy is going down. It's not serving your spirit. However, there's a lot of um, mystical doctrines, tantric type of doctrines that don't reject um, they don't reject orgasm. They don't reject fornication. And they say things um, they say things that, you know, you should be kind, you should be nice, you know, do good works. Uh, you can develop these powers. And they talk very, very well and very, very delicate. And they kind of dress it up in a lot of beautiful words and spiritual type of concepts. But when it gets to the, the crux of the matter, they talk about, well, you need, you need to, you can't conserve your sexual energy. You have to get rid of it. And then they talk about, well, that's what we are. How could, that would be against us. That would be a violence against our body if we were, if we were to not expel it. Of course, this is, these are doctrines that try to mix you know, a spiritual longing with fornication. And that always leads into someone being tied, tied more tightly to go down into the infernal worlds. And uh, Samuel Unviol writes that uh, the most difficult or the most subtle types of uh, you know, black, black magic or inferior doctrines are related to the mind and the mental world. So he writes, Almost all spiritualist schools teach how to develop mental force. They all want to fortify the mind. This is how they, many end up practicing black magic. The mind is the donkey on which we must ride in order to enter into the heavenly Jerusalem. The mind, the manus, the mind must debase itself before the majesty of the innermost. This is ignored by spiritualist devotees. Thus, what they always want to do is their own selfish will and never the will of the Father. This is the terrible truth of all these things. Evilness is so fine in the world of the mind. Evilness is so delicate and subtle in the plane of cosmic understanding that in reality a lot of intuition is needed in order not to be cheated by the demons of the mental world. The black magi magicians are millions of times more fine and delicate in the mental plane than the black magicians of the astral plane. So there's many, many different types of doctrines. We can see them today. You know, Some that, of course, make... Uh, you know, very obvious that they're just trying to achieve more and more desire, and, and it's very easy. It's very, so certain types of people get attracted to that. But other types of people really feel a, a spiritual longing, and they get tied up in all this type of spiritual language. And it seems so nice, and everybody's so happy. Um, but they're really engaging in a way that's just trying to make their mind more powerful. They're trying to develop powers, they're not trying to reduce their ego. They're just trying to develop something with, without reducing their ego. So if we practice if we practice chastity, if we begin to conserve our sexual energy, if we practice pranayamas, which is certain type of breathing exercises, if we practice certain mantras, if we are doing something sincere in ourselves, if we are doing a good work, then we start to conserve our energy. This, is not, uh, this does not go unnoticed in the inner worlds, because it's similar to lighting a fire in a dark wooded area, kind of there's so much darkness that if a certain person is really trying to conserve their energy, that creates a certain type of light that's easy to be noticed. And of course, this gets attention towards the, you know, the White Lodge or these awakened masters who are looking to help. So if they're looking to help, 
They say, well, let's see if this person, this individual, this aspirin, is ready to work on themselves. Can they become an enemy of, them own, of their own self? Because in this work, the true enemy is, is yourself, your own ego, your own selfish self-will. And if you don't, if you're unable to be afraid, if you're afraid to look into yourself, if you're afraid of yourself, of the image, of your own psychological image, if you're unable to attack your own psychological image, if that causes you to be afraid, there's no way you could progress. So really the first ordeal in this sense is what we call the guardian of the threshold. And this is something that occurs in the um, inner worlds, in the superior worlds where the aspirant has to invoke their guardian of the threshold and they have to defeat him. I really shouldn't even, defeat them or conjure the guardian without having any fear in their heart because this terrible image appears, this p terrible animal, animalistic image that can be terrifying for the aspirant. If they cower in fear, obviously, Obviously, they're um, unable to work on themselves. They will fail that ordeal. If that happens, well, then the aspirant has to meditate again, meditate more on that. To be able to pass that ordeal is to be able to see that image and not be afraid of it, to pass through it. What that's signifying is that that aspirant is able to take up arms against their own ego, is able to look at themselves <laughs> without being afraid. And that really signifies that they're able to, to work on themselves, to move forward. That's really the first type of step. Now, what also can happen here is an aspirant is trying to work on themselves, trying to develop themselves, or interested in different spiritual doctrines, and they become you know, enamored perhaps by a doctrine that's really um, not a trying to achieve initiation. So these type of schools always talk about spiritual things, but instead of the guardian of the threshold being the enemy to pass through, they assume that this guardian is the protector. That this guardian of the threshold is their true being. That the ego is their true being, is their true spirit. So anyone involved in black magic, black initiation, is looking to integrate themselves tighter with the guardian of the threshold. And it's not always called the guardian of the threshold. It might just be called your true self. Might, you know, the doctrine may say different things. But it is fundamentally, those types of doctrines always speak against chastity. They always speak against Christ. Whatever form or whatever language it is, it comes down to that. They speak against Christ, they speak against chastity. Because it's only through chastity that you can even begin to take up arms or to be able to take up a fight with your own ego, with the guardian. If you don't have chastity, then you can't do anything. If you don't have engine, if you don't have uh, fuel in the engine, you can't go anywhere. In the same way, if you don't have chastity, you cannot do any of this work. But the schools of black magic always talk very beautifully of how you need to revere the guardian and even try to integrate with the guardian. And the guardian is your protector, your guardian. Sometimes they call, some schools call it the guardian angel, even though it's not what we would call the guardian angel. Well, not what we would say Gnostically the guardian angel, but these are just words. But they call it the guardian angel, your guardian and you want to connect with that and protect that. So what's happening in that sense is that if there's a spiritual longing and you want to, and you want to integrate with that, you're trying to awake and even observe yourselves. Anyone who's involved in the School of Black Magic is going to look to develop their mind, to awaken, but not remove any desire. In fact, awaken and integrate with that desire. Awaken, become aware of that, of that energy that has... Um, a selfishness or a hatred or whatever, like in a certain way that you can become focused through anger. You can become focused through desire. Become one-pointed through desire. Not one-pointed through the liberation of desire. 
And that's how you begin to awaken. You, you observe your desires and you enforce them. You reinforce them. You integrate tighter, trying to achieve some type of tight integration of the soul and the ego. <clears throat> of course, that's a, that is a... Um, that is a uh, process which is ultimately going to cause a lot of pain and suffering. Because underneath the, the ego and the soul is that essence which belongs in the sixth dimension. It comes from the absolute. So eventually that's going to be extracted out of there through a very painful process. It may take cosmic days depending on the level of initiation that the person achieved in that, in that sense. There's different types of black magicians. If the person has developed themselves in, uh, in Christic initiations, they build solar bodies, they build vehicles related to the internal worlds, electronic Christic vehicles. If they then fall, re redevelop or reinforce the ego, they have two polarities. They have a polarity related to the soul, which is fallen, and there's a polarity related to the spirit, which is, has development and maybe even be a master. These types of black magicians are the, the worst, absolutely the worst, because they are very diabolical, very powerful. Um, and we've talked about a lot of these in previous lectures. They're called uh, Hannes Musen. So Hannes Musen is a plural. Hannes Mus is the individual. So there's different levels of Hannes Musen. Anybody with ego is really a Hannes Mus. But uh, the real Hannes Musen are the ones who achieved initiation developed solar bodies, and then fell for certain reasons that um, we've discussed in other lectures. But nevertheless, they're there. Because the only way to develop those, those bodies is through chastity. So at one point, they must have been chased and developed those bodies. Uh, however, someone who is, doesn't have those bodies, they can still develop powers through the mind. They can still empower their ego. They just won't have the solar bodies. And they may awaken, and they may have powers, and they may be able to manipulate people here physically in this world. They may be able to manipulate people in a subtle sense, be able to, be able to help put people to sleep and to uh, like hypnotize people you know, in a certain sense, to make them fascinated with, with whatever they're, they're saying, to kind of help them. They may um, do certain things. They may give gifts to people that have a certain... Uh, you know, curse on them or whatever, that they injure another person. For whatever reason. They make, they make a game out of it. So, again, we have these two sides of the guardian, the threshold. The, the white initiate, the Christic initiate, is going to try to defeat the guardian. Whereas the black magician is trying, going to try to empower the guardian. And sees the guardian as their true self. However, if we, if we defeat the guardian, really we're not killing the guardian of the threshold, we are at least, but we are at least uh, defeating him in a single battle. doesn't mean we've killed the guardian because that's the whole process. It just means that that's the first part to pass the ordeal of the guardian of the threshold. Now, if you are successful in that ordeal, you'll be given the first initial ordeals related to the four elements. And this is a picture here we can see of the fire, the air, the water, and the earth. And the initiate here, or the aspirant, with his weapon, trying to defeat those ordeals. And we can see that this is the same person. It's the same person defeating themselves. So, of course, this is an alchemical work. This is a work of, of, of you know developing ourselves through different elements that we symbolize through these four elements. So there's different types of ordeals. The ordeal of fire is an ordeal that gets your blood boiling. Typically, if someone slanders you or curses you, if someone uh, gossips about you or someone says bad things to you, criticizes you, how do you handle that? How do you handle that moment? Does it make your blood boil? Do you return that with hatred? Are you able to kiss the whip of the executioner, as the master states? 
Are you able, are you able to return hate with, with love and serenity? And not false humility either, but true peace, a true peaceful heart. That's, that's transforming that, and that's uh, going through the ordeal of fire. But the ordeal of fire may not be one moment. What if someone's slandering you and slandering you over and over again? Does that eat you up? Does that eat up your heart? Does that make you feel pain? So these ordeals can occur physically, or they may occur, occur internally. You may have a, an experience, because if you're working with your consciousness, if you're working with the transmutation of energy, sexual energy, you're going to start to have, you're going to start to awaken, you know, through little, little, uh, little experiences, things that appear like a dream, but, but different. They're more awakened, they're more spiritual, they're more powerful, or, you know, or having just awakened experiences in the astral plane. And you may even, ha- you may even experience something where you're, you're being burned or, or being put to fire in that, in that sense, right? So that's a, that's, that's a symbolic representation of going through an ordeal. Or you may just be slandered in the astral plane and seeing if you can pass through that ordeal because in the astral plane, you're, you access your emotions so much more subtly and finely and directly. You can't hide from them. Here in the physical world, you can kind of compartmentalize your emotions and think that you're not angry, but really you're very angry. In the astral plane, you would just be angry. You access that right away. So, for example, um, I know personally experiences in the astral plane where I got really angry. <laughs> and I woke up and I said, well, I, that person was slandering me in the astral plane, and I don't think I would be like that, but I really was. I mean, that was showing me that, my, that I wasn't able to handle that criticism. So in that particular ordeal, in the one that I'm remembering, obviously I didn't pass that, and that was an ordeal of fire. And what that meant was I had to sit down and meditate. I had to reflect on that, look into it, see what was I accessing, what was that about. If you pass the ordeal, you pass the ordeal. If you don't, then it has to be given to you again. And if it's given to you again, it's probably going to be more severe. You need to learn the lesson. You need to have the consequences applied more bluntly. And sometimes we need to be hit like straight on the head multiple times before we realize what we need to realize. Uh, and so ordeals of the air are related, obviously, to our mind, um, especially because the air and mind are, are the air is the symbol of, symbol of the mind. Be able to soar above circumstances. To not be, you know, to rise above difficult ordeals. Um, for example, I had one particular, I remember uh, something happening to me uh, in the astral plane where I was seeing these clouds above me and they were very powerful clouds. They were looked like concrete, like a whole row of clouds coming from the left and a whole rolling of all these really dense, thick clouds. I was really terrified by these clouds. And they were coming from both sides, and they hit each other right in the middle, right over me, and like exploded, and all this hail started falling down. And I was, I don't know what to do, but thankfully I found a truck next to me, and I hid in the truck, and the truck was all bouncing around and everything. And later the truck, and I opened up, and and the truck was all beaten up, but I was safe, and I looked up, and the sky was beautiful. So that was a relationship to some ordeal. You know, interesting, you know, the, 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 the thesis versus the antithesis in our mind. Two competing theories, two competing ideas that we can't, can't get through. We don't know how to move through them. It causes so much anguish. One moment we're thinking one thing versus another. We can't get through that. You know, so that ordeal to, to find refuge in the vehicle of gnosis is the way you get through the battles of the mind that we go under. And of course, we have our deals of water. Water, of course, is the ability to, you know, change circumstances easily, to be able to flow to different circumstances. Can you handle different circumstances? Of course, too, water is related to more, most particularly your sexual energy, but uh, the ability to, to adapt ourselves. And our deals of the earth um, can be related to our physical existence of mundane life, being, being, you know, being able to overcome just these mundane daily tasks and ordeals without becoming fascinated by them, without being dragged down by them. 
or, you know, or deals of the earth may be related to our laziness, our, our uh, fascination with making money or developing or working, toiling away in earthly matters that have nothing to do with the spirit, being fascinated into that, you know, and, and being able to overcome that, or just being lazy, uh, because uh, the earth is related to the gnomes, and the gnomes are very diligent workers that get the gold, and they work very diligently. So if we are passing ordeals of the earth, we're like that gnome extracting the gold. So we pass all these ordeals. <clears throat> but in reality, every ordeal, whether it's the four ordeals that we pass initially, or whether it's any initiation, minor or major, all of those initiations, every progress that we make is going to be an ordeal related to these four elements. Maybe a combination of them, uh, or maybe not. But every, don't, don't think that, it, that there's these four ordeals and then you go into the minor initiations and the major initiations, you never deal with the four elements again. Every ordeal is related to the elements. In one level or another. You keep passing ordeals at more and more subtle levels. So after the four, those four initial ordeals is when someone's placed onto the path. I don't have a slide for it. They're placed on the path of minor initiations, the minor mysteries. And there are nine minor mysteries. So anybody who's practicing in chastity can, can achieve this. And, uh, of course, the, f the nine minor uh, mysteries are related to uh, you know, the first nine sephiroth and the tree of life. But you pass them. You know, as someone in chastity, working with chastity through meditation, through transmutation, you're given ordeals, you're given certain experiences, and through, you know, help, you begin to learn about yourself. You're tested. You know, this is always, this is always looking into yourself. What's coming out? You think of um, when you have, when you're cooking something or the alchemist boiling all of these elements and seeing what's coming out of it, you know? You don't, if, the elements, if the elements don't boil, then you don't get the extract. So our life has to be boiled down to these moments and extract the, the conscious knowledge out of it and get rid of the West. Because you know? in our ego, our ego is what we need to remove to destroy, but our ego holds all of our, our essence, and that essence has that experience of being in that ego. So by learning... You, you gain wisdom, and you gain love, you gain compassion, and you see, and when you learn that, you're able to extract yourself out of that ego and, and destroy it. So we pass through nine initiations of minor mysteries, and after that, you can begin to be placed on the path of major mysteries. However, in order to achieve the major mysteries, one must not just be chaste, but they have to be in sexual cooperation. So the minor mysteries can be achieved by any individual, single or married, but they have to be in chastity. When you achieve the ninth initiation of minor mysteries, that's when you can continue to develop yourself, meditation, transmutation, you can develop and reduce the ego more and more and more. However, the major mysteries require a spouse uh, to generate more energy, to develop more energy. And it's through the, ma the major mysteries that you develop the solar bodies. And from there, more types of initiations occur. There's different types of paths. There's the spiral path, the direct path, and there's vehicles related to the top triangle. But all of this, um, more related to other lectures. This lecture is just for an introduction of what initiation is. So to sum it all up, we need to be able to discern the difference between what would be initiation towards Christ and what is initiation towards the ego or the demon. And just because a school looks spiritual doesn't mean doesn't mean anything, really. You have to investigate internally. Because it's very, very subtle. They may be giving a doctrine that looks very spiritual, but if they're not talking about using the sexual energy in a way to create your soul, 
then you're not going to gain much out of it. Meditation, a lot of, a lot of schools are meditating. There's a lot of uh, yoga studios. They do some meditation in the beginning and end. That's good. Develop observation, mindfulness. That's good. You could also observe, you know, develop mindfulness by washing the dishes. So, but the mindfulness is good, but if the person is wasting all their energy sexually, then how are they going to be able to, to, to develop their energy emotionally? How are they going to be able to develop a compassionate heart? That all comes from the sex. Our sexual energy is the basic energy that creates all of our spiritual experiences. It, ref- it's, it all starts with the Yesod, the foundation. And that is why we are always talking about it. And we're never uh, becoming tired of uh, clarifying that we need to work with the sexual energy. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I, I I didn't I didn't I didn't know that it's possible. I, yeah, demon means of me. So we know that the uh, demon is God inverted, um, and you know, but they look the same sometimes. You know, the demon can have the uh, very beautiful robes that we place on it. So. So the question is, if you develop or achieve initiations or just develop your consciousness in general and then turn away from it, is it... It seems like there was was always, in in the literature that I've read, there was always sort of a component of mid-time. There was a point where you were were no longer just sort of investigating the psyche, but you you took the issue onto that path, and you were serious about it on the path. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think in the past, when it was definitely guarded, if they knew that, they might even execute you physically, right? If you were because, uh, or if you were to divulge any of this information, they would execute you. Um, but it's karmically anyway a similar thing that if you develop on this path, you know, Master Samuel and Vior stated that uh, curious people should should not really engage in these studies too much. I mean, you should be curious, but the outcome of this doctrine is either angels or demons. That's what he said. He said the outcome of this doctrine is angels or demons. Because if you're going to work with the sexual energy, you're going to start empowering yourself. And if you don't, if you don't destroy the ego, then you're developing yourself into a more powerful Hannes Mus, a more powerful demon. Now, if you, if you turn away, that's your own karma. Because you know more. You will be, so you will get more karma for that because you know more. And so just simply turn away from it. You have to, you face more severe consequences because you know what the path should be. And if you just choose not to do it, you get more severe consequences because of it. Mm-hmm. 
way the ego sort of swirling like a tornado because the that quality that you see the ego as is not fear is the way the ego perceives that the reason for that. I, I don't know if the ego makes it real, but I'm I'm assuming that they they see it as fear. Yeah. I mean they wouldn't see it anything negative. So the question is, you know, if someone is developing they're guarding the threshold and uniting with it. They're not going to see it as a negative thing. They're not going to see it like as some terrible, frightening thing. It's going to be dressed up just in, this, just in the same way that everybody loves themselves in this world, right? And if they get criticized, like, well, you know, they get all flippant and, you know, whatever. They don't, I don't need to worry about them. And they don't take any level of criticism whatsoever because they love themselves so much. So they love their guardian. And, of course, it would, it would appear in some way that would be sympathetic to that. I mean, and everything... This is the part of the idea, you know, of good and evil. Of evolution, the words "good" and "evil" should be replaced by the words "evolving" and "devolving." Um, and what we think is evil is good for someone who's practicing that, and what we think is good is evil for that for them. So if we were you're in a in, um, someone somewhere in a temple of black magic, and you were to talk about Christ, they would think you were talking about a demon because that cry that light hurts them that light makes them feel weak and it's and it's it doesn't feel right so it's bad it's evil it is going it's against them so if you proclaim yourself for for christ then then yeah that's going to be like whatever is good is evil whatever is evil is good you know everything gets turned upside down Hmm. Well, so is there blame for it? Well, that that kind of that gets into the whole cosmic scenario, and and karma. Uh, it's in the same way that if I park next to a fire hydrant that's covered with snow in New York City, I'll still get a ticket. <laughs> I learned that. Um, <laughs> but now I know. I learned it, right? So, what's that? Right. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Precisely. Yeah. That's that's what I would. Yeah. So the Kabbalist who has wrote a lot of books and has like some popularity amongst people who have a interest in occultism, Aleister Crowley would talk about the holy guardian angel and his guardian angel and he would, he would talk about that. But really he was connecting with his guardian of the threshold. We would call it the guardian of the threshold. So just because someone's talking about something that's holy, we have to really be discernment. Because if you investigate that his doctrine, you see it's not a doctrine of chastity whatsoever, of course. And he also speaks against Jesus. He speaks against Christ in his books. Um, and he makes a kind of game out of everything, too. I mean, there's, we could speak about that at length, but the, the basic the fundamental thing is if you're not practicing chastity, but you're, you're developing, but you're not practicing chastity, then the only thing you could be feeding is your ego. That energy is going to go somewhere. So... Right, so we are in the uh, fifth root race of the terrestrial period, which is the lowest period of the great cosmic day. The Kali Yuga, the Kali Yuga of the fifth root, yes. Yeah, so we are really, we're in a situation that uh, we're in a very, a, a time that we need to really be clear about everything. And we might say, well, it's very difficult. Why do we deserve this? Why can't I be born... You know, one of these one of these things up here, right? In the seventh, why can't I be there? 
Uh, well, in a certain sense, first of all, we have more fuel here to work on our ego. We have more of an ability to go really straight and define ourselves very clearly because we have, you know, you go to the gym, you, 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 if you lift heavier weights, you build more muscle. So we have to take advantage of that. And if we do, we really can define ourselves and develop ourselves very quickly and powerfully. Secondly, The, being in this race, being in this humanoid body right now, we went through a humongous evolution, right, to get to this point. How do we know how many... Well, I should go back and explain a little bit. But we have 3,000 turns, so to speak, on this great evolving and devolving wheel. You know, this whole thing takes a long time, and that happens. You know, if we go down and go back up, it's, gonna, it's not going to be for a long time, right? And we can say we have like 3,000 of those opportunities. Now, I don't know my, my karma to know, but I, I think that there might be a reason why I'm in this particular situation as opposed to a better one, whatever a better one might be. If I'm here, then my karma must put me here. This is my situation. This is my, my situation. So perhaps, you know, I've been around this wheel many times, and this is where I need to be because I need to learn. I don't know. I really don't know. I don't. I try not to speculate, but um, I, you know, sometimes it's th seen in that sense that like it's so terrible. Like we're here, but there's a way to get through that. And if you feel a resistance or like a longing that you were in a different root race or a different age, then you you should probably investigate where that's coming from because there's probably something to learn about yourself. Anything else? Oh uh, yeah, just one more thing. So the, the wheel, right? And then you you mentioned that. The Right. So that just reminded me of the, the symbol of Mars, actually. Mm -hmm. Arrow going up, yeah. I'm sure there's some relationships there. And if I didn't make it clear before, yes. Yeah, so this is like this mechanical wheel, and the way to step off that wheel is through initiation, which is right at the top, and you go up to get off that wheel. But there's another type of evolution that people pick related to what's called the spiral path, which is a very type of almost evolution there. It's like it's, it's conscious, but it's very slow. And that would be another lecture talking about the spiral path and the direct path. That's why I kind of stopped before we got there. That's kind of a hard question, right? All right, I'm ready for the hard question. Okay. So in the major mystery, somewhere along the earth, there's an initiation that intimate realization of what is the demonic initiation? Demonic. So the the initiation is an intimate realization of the consciousness. That was the quote from the. Yeah, it's, it's, it's roughly from the from the major mystery. So if the white initiations are intimate realizations of our own consciousness, or something similar to that, now what's the demonic initiation? The demonic initiation, in my understanding, is knowing yourself is is connecting. Your, to your ego more and more, so you're realizing that more and more, because we're asleep. We have an ego, but we're asleep to that ego. So awakening is, is, pol is polarized. So you awake into that ego, knowing it even more. Because like you have anger, and you just kind of get off kilter and off balance or whatever, but if you have anger, and you know exactly how to focus that anger, then that anger becomes a stream of energy that you can do things with. You can focus into it. And to know your desires more and more deeply. That's what I would think you know, black initiations would be. Yep. So you said the earth doesn't want the soul to be involved. Right. Okay, does that mean, I mean, that doesn't mean Melchizedek maybe there's no need to be Right. What if there's a, do you mean Melchizedek doesn't want the soul to be involved? Okay, so the question is about... <laughs> So the question is about the evolving and devolving uh, nature related to our planet or to any planet versus the genie of that planet, which is Melchizedek. Uh, what's the whole, what's going on here? Well, really, there's just basically there's, it, there's two things. There's the economy of the world, which is, is, is like you know, a machine that's sustaining itself. But also the initiates are still working to provide a harvest or a crop of solar men or solar initiates. So it's not that you know, Melchizedek is trying to 
you know, subvert us. It's not the truth at all. Melchizedek is a resurrected master. So it just means that there, this has to, it, it has to happen like this because in another sense, we need, to, we need to develop some level of ego in order to fight against it to develop ourselves. It's just this planet Earth is particularly difficult. So there needs to be that energy going up and down, and we're inside of that. We need to have a choice to, def- to define ourselves. So it's not that he's against it, no. Right. The inferior worlds would be empty. There's different levels of what would happen there. So, for example, the sun, any star is a planet that's evolved to that level. So our sun is actually a planet. We investigate it through, you know, materialistically, we only see uh, gases and light and energy coming out of it, but really it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a planet with a, people live on it, but they're all an issue. They're all solar beings. So that's okay because the planet reached that level. It's at that level of karma, that level of energy, and it just is a clean, the, the hell realms are still there, but they're clean. There's nothing there. And it's just at that level. Um, we still have a lot of energy to process because our earth is at the level that it's at. Uh, because the earth, you know, in a certain sense, the earth had to be pulled down into the terrestrial world and eventually it does have to go up. So it needs to start getting rid of some of that, of that energy. But for right now, or at least in recent times, it needed the stability. So that's... Does that mean that the earth will eventually evolve into a star? Will an earth eventually evolve into a star? That is the cosmic scenario that's supposed to happen. I mean, any planet is uh, you know, a type of, of energy that wants to be a host for more energy to, to evolve or you know, to progress. Um, so when you reach very high initiations, you, you have the Bodhisattva, the Christic you know, Dhyani Bodhisattva, but then you also have a Logos, the, the top triangle, and that becomes incarnated that Logos has the ability to become the manager of a planet, of a planetary consciousness, which then handles all of that energy of a plan- at, its, at the level of a planet. So that's the, the, a planet is like almost a physical manifestation of a Logos. So there is another level of evolving, or, and not, not, I wouldn't say evolving, but initiating themselves further and further into the absolute. They need to handle enormous amounts of energy perfectly. And part of that, part of that plan is to be able to, to be the host of a, of a planet's energy. So any planet is, an, is, is progressing towards becoming a star. The moon is a cadaver of a previous planet. It's the representation of the, of the planet's prior uh, cosmic day. So that moon crystallized because it's, it's just the cadaver or final remnants of that energy, our moon, is related to the, you know, just in the same way that we die, if our physical body goes into the ground and we're put into another physical body, the old physical body is still rotting. It's still, it's still decomposing. So that's what the moon is. That's what the moons are. Or any, any moon of a planet is related to to prior karmic events. We think that um, the universe came as a physical thing and everything exploded and then all these planets appeared. But really, we go back much further than that, that is that physical material had to condense out of its karmic you know, level from the absolute, from very subtle levels and it condenses in that sense. So. That's why the moon is our is the Earth's previous uh, body. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, when you're talking about uh, answers, and uh, you said that if you're not answered to the answer, we would be in the world somewhere, feeding your ego. 
excuse me, the PPR plant is there to do the doing of the work. Could we also do doing the legal? You could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you're not practicing chastity, but you're trying to develop your mind, you're definitely feeding the ego. But even if you are practicing chastity, it doesn't mean that you're automatically not feeding the ego. It's, you know, this, going back to what um, the Master stated in terms of becoming either an angel or a demon, uh, you know, this work is the uh, Faustian pact, the bet with the devil, that, you know, it's, it's, it's a game, it's, it's a pact that you're going to be working with that. But if you make a mistake, if you fall into error, into confusion, then if you're not in alignment with Christ, then you're going to be left, like, alone. You're not going to have that guidance, that wisdom. Even um, Simon the Magician. Simon the Magician knew the great arcanum, knew everything about chastity, was an initiate, a, a relatively high initiate in my understanding. So, but he rejected the new current of Christ through Jesus. He did not, he did not accept that. So even though he was awakened, even though he's practicing sexual magic and knew that, was even teaching it, he did not accept the new current. If the, if the current is, if the Christic current of our time is running through a particular master or through a particular host, and you're not in alignment with that, then you're going to be like, you know, a tumbleweed. The only way back to the absolute is through Christ. So if you're not in alignment with Christ, then you're going to fall to the wayside, even if you know all this stuff. So there are a lot of dangers. A lot of ways we need to always be careful and investigate ourselves. Just because we're practicing chastity, just because you're in a Gnostic school, just because you have this or that, doesn't mean that you're not, that doesn't mean that you are eliminating your ego. You know you're eliminating your ego when you're changing as a person. When you're in front of situations and you behave differently. When you have different impulses. And you may also have certain experiences in the inner world. You may not as well. So you have to meditate. Do the work. The thing that they usually So before, before resurrection, there's a lot of different ways to, to fall into mistakes. And even a totally resurrected, unless they're in the absolute, there's still a danger of falling. Because even a clean mind, even a clean solar mind still has an ability to choose its self-will. It's not ego, but they can make a mistake. And that's usually happening by falling in love, the physical body falling in love. And then... Right, right. 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 So the comments made it's very important. Um, there's all th there's a diverse types of schools, even within this particular tradition, many different types of schools, and there's a very unfortunate reality that number one, there's a lot of political games and, and personalities fighting each other. And you know, if we all have ego, obviously there's going to be disagreements, but we need to focus on ourselves and on the work and not get lost in somebody said this and somebody didn't do that and etc cetera, etc cetera, to follow what's written down in the works of the master if it's not clear if it's not clear then you can stay silent meditate but don't go making a fuss or making a big deal and talking cuz talking kills schools you know our words and slander and gossip can kill schools and there may be something not perfect with the school but if it is if it is killed, then you may be really causing a true spiritual injury, not just for yourself, but for other people there who could benefit. So there's a lot of delicate things, you know. Um, and another thing that I want to talk about that reminds me is that when we achieve initiation, it is not us. It is the innermost. It is the master that achieves the initiations. So even if you're achieving initiations, it's not your physical body. It's not your ego. It's not your personality. It's the inner master. And even if a person achieves that and has an inner master, doesn't mean that the, the personality that's talking right now is the master that's talking. Because the first initiation causes the fusion or connection between the spiritual soul and Atman. And 
the innermost. That creates a master monad. But it's not until the very end of initiation that that energy is incarnated in the person. The person has to, get, has to die, and the master becomes crystallized at lower and lower levels. And when you resurrect, then the master's there physically. But if someone, even if someone has, you know, was able to achieve a, an initiation, and maybe they even they know their name of their master, then they say, I am such and such. Well, that's the personality saying that. You have to be very careful. So the first question is, the, the innermost does not achieve black initiations. The, and black initiations are only achieved by the ego, which is in the fifth dimension, the inferior aspect of the fifth dimension. So the innermost does not achieve black initiations. Certainly, if you make mistakes and you go through black initiations and you extract yourself out by, by going on the white path, you learn from that. You still have to pay the karma or, or you know, you have to overcome good and evil. So, yes, uh, in a certain sense, mistakes are where we, we gain the, sapien the sapience of sin, the wisdom of mistakes. And what was your, was that? Your yeah, and then uh, time and magician. Mm -hmm. So exactly a particular particular uh, decision that, that Simon the Magician made, I don't know. But perhaps if he felt that the hierarchy... This person, uh, if you think uh, some other master is higher than Jesus, or you're higher than that, you know, there ha there's a hierarchy, you know, of, of, of masters. And they are directing down from the absolute. So if you're not following in that hierarchy, if you reject, you know, that master, but you're still trying to work on yourself, you're going to fall out, fall away from that. So even though you're working uh, with sexual magic, you know, Right, so even, even whatever karma we have is, has ultimate connection with our innermost, with our, with our master, our innermost. So if we were achieving black initiations, part of it was the, the monad didn't have the capacity or the willpower or the ability to help control us. So it has to pay for that. And sometimes we talk about, well, so why are some people interested in this teaching and some people are not? And that's a lot of related to do with our monad as well. If someone is searching for the teaching and they feel like an emptiness in their heart and a spiritual longing, it's because the, the monad is whipping us or telling us to they look, continue, search, search. Other people don't care. They, they, they don't have that connection for one reason or another. So they don't have to judge anybody you know, for what they do. Yeah, so working with practices to increase willpower. Um, a human being in the office can get very complacent. Yes. And, you know, if you think if you're here, you're listening to lectures, you know, you're doing a little bit of serious work, you're, you're on the path. And in reality, you could just be going through the motions as opposed to actually 
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the, there's so many dangers within and without on the path. Like, you can even be going to a school, be giving all the right, doing all the right things, learning, you know, studying, talking the talk, so to speak, and, not, and subtly not realizing that you're doing everything mechanically. You're not really engaging your consciousness. You're not really looking at yourself. Even if it's really almost amazing, but even if you're meditating, you can almost do it in a very lazy way. And you have to continually... Look into yourself. And that's why there's a strange saying that um, sometimes when you think you're doing well on the path, you're actually doing very poorly. And sometimes you're, when you think you're doing very poorly, you're actually doing very well. Because when you think you're doing well, you're not looking at yourself because you're kind of like strutting around thinking you're doing, you know, you have your checklist of I go to the school, I do this, I med-, you know, and you're kind of doing it with a complacency, not really looking into yourself. And then later on, you realize, oh my goodness, I've been so complacent. I can't believe this. I need to work. This and this. I made all these mistakes. And then you start looking into yourself and correcting yourself and working with yourself. And then you actually you might make some progress again. So. So is there a relationship between the guardian of the threshold and Lucifer? Yes. Uh, we know that Lucifer is a, the part of Christ the sundurable part of Christ, which, which comes down and mingles with our ego. So there's that diabolical nature there of, of testing us and mixed with our ego. You know, so our guardian threshold is part of that. But uh, we can say that Lucifer is the part that is, that is playing, that is trying to defeat us through the guardian. You know, you know because Lucifer wants to test us. He needs to um, make sure that we are what, what, what we want to be, that we're, we have to be tested. You know, we don't know the true nature of something unless you get, unless you get tested. So, yeah, I mean, Lucifer is the part of our ego that, uh, or Lucifer is that part of Christ which mingles with the ego. And the ego is the guardian of the threshold. So, yeah. Yes, yeah, so the suggestion is made to see Mephistopheles in the opera. It's very good, actually. You can see him going up and down ladders. Yeah. Okay. Does the guardian have anything to do with that, of the presence that you're feeling, like, in between awake and sleep? Yeah, sometimes, I mean, it's, just, it's something that happens occasionally. It's like a, in the in-between state, I'll, there'll be, and I've read about this, where it's just this calm There could be so many different reasons for that, related to your own ego, seeing your own ego. You know, children, little babies who don't have a personality developed yet cry because they can see their own demonic ego trying to enter in. So it could be related to that. And of course, if it's related to your ego, then it's related to the guardian. If it's related to innate fear, instinctual types of fear, then it's related to, to the guardian as well because it keeps you in that fear, you know, overcoming that type of instinctual fear is something that you have to work with. So in a sense, yes, but there could be other reasons related, you know, to someone's trying to manipulate you and a black magician. But again, people project, and uh, sometimes you yeah, have uh, black magicians might be attacking us. But sometimes people get um, uh, really overly fascinated with that, and it's really just their projections of their ego. They need to work on their own fears. But we have also practices related to defending ourselves, which. Yeah, that would be a whole nother lecture. Okay, thank you all. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. 
You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.